Scott, one well, something I really enjoyed kind of seeing because I remember I remember watching Guar on Much Music in Winnipeg when I was still living there, probably about ninety ninety one. So I've been with the kind of the growth of the band from the start, and seeing the kind of pop culture, the influence that they've had, and, and almost becoming part of this mid nineties pop culture movement. I'd kind of forgotten about that. It was really interesting to see just how also important something like MTV was to the success of the band. Yeah. And it's pretty cool. You know, we go into it that it was difficult. You know, MTV was kind of freaked out, kind of scared. And then Mike Judge put him on Beavis and Butthead, which I think is really cool. You know, we have Matt Pinfield in the doc, which is really cool. uh, Talking about how that was a really great way for Mike Judge to kind of backdoor bands <laughs> right to mtv the same with white zombie you know uh they'll credit beavis and butthead for for making their career that was another band that beavis and butthead liked although guar was their favorite <laughs> and uh you know one thing that was interesting to me uh i was kind of coming of age at that time i was getting into music at that time you know in 1991 i was a preteen you know starting to get into music and um music was changing it was going from Poison and Motley Crue over to Nirvana, you know, in that right. those years, like 91 to 94, when I was really learning more and more about Guar, I love how they were the polar opposites of both. Like, how does that make any sense? How can you be the opposite of two things that are already <laughs> opposite, you know? And I thought that was really cool that they were the two trends that were happening right now. They weren't anything like either of them. And then, you know, you look at them and they can never be dated. You know, they can never be dated like a like a hair metal band or a grunge band or whatever. Well, and, and, and it's interesting, once again, just talking about the Mike Judge, how he was able to kind of program his own music onto Beavis and Butthead. And Beavis and Butthead were so popular that they allowed that. Because as much as, like you said, it helped Guar and helped White Zombie, it also like completely destroyed like Winger. Like Winger was oh, yeah. done <laughs> because of Beavis and Butthead. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think he tried to sue them. If I'm if I'm correct, I think Winger tried to uh, try to do something <laughs> against them. Yeah. No, uh, Brad, and I'm I'm not sure if it, it, both or if you were still in the band at the time. But how was that for you guys? Was it kind of like because once again, here is just a bunch of art school guys, punk rock guys, and suddenly you're becoming one of the biggest bands in America. Was it kind of an overnight thing after Beavis and Butthead, or, 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 or let me rephrase it: Did Beavis and Butthead take things to a completely different level, or you recognize it right out of the gate? I didn't recognize I about the point you made when the music was shifting from hair metal to grunge. We were right in this position with a brand new record deal with Metal Blade that we were mixing the record and we went down to Virgin Records in Manhattan and we bought Nevermind and we put it on the studio. And we really thought at that position in time that music was going to definitely take a new direction hair metal was over but we weren't sure what the next thing was and guar really thought it was kind of poised to like be a thing that would be mainstream even though our lyrical content is not very mainstream Mm -hmm. but as soon as we put that record on in the studio we were just like it's over (laughs) that's what it's going to be it's going to be this crap you know this nirvana that's what it's going to be i don't know if we thought it was disappointing at the time but guar always knew it wasn't really a mainstream animal but uh, we thought there was a pocket for us, at least in that moment, that we could really, really gain some traction. And because grunge took off so quick, I think Guar might have been forgotten about if it wasn't for Mike Judge and Beavis, because that came right after and like kept us in the game somehow. And so it was super important, I think, in that in that part of our career. It's also been more more sort of cumulative. You know, in the moment, it didn't really transform things for us. Because we were already, I mean, we were doing pretty well. And, you know, I think we escalated a little bit, but it's more like the long-term effect of that, where it's like people come up to us all the time and say, we saw you for the first time on Beavis and Budhead. But all of our contracts and everything were already in place, so it didn't really, like, change the world for us or anything. But over time, just hearing how many people, that was where they heard about us, it's we're so grateful uh, to Mike for, for helping us that way. What I always found was interesting about Guar is like how they always had these couple year check-ins, you know, it's like Alex Winter's like idiot box or Joan Rivers show. He was in butthead empire records. Was it for me? Like seeing that, right. You guys in that movie, it was like, Oh, that's amazing. And then like later with bam or Jerry Springer, all these different shows is every one couple years. There's like 
you guys were on the Daily Show. It's like it's just always like, oh right, Guar, they're still awesome. We're like herpes. We never go. 